Thank you very much indeed, uh, Natalie, for uh, being the master of ceremonies. Melissa, I don't know where you got this information from, but I'm really impressed. I didn't know all that about myself. And uh, uh, Ms. Condolo, thank you uh, for arranging this. Wherever I go, first of all, I apologize for not being in a tie. I'm impressed by this too. <laughs> I'm going straight to the airport to take a flight. And I apologize for being late. I'm sorry, we just, uh, no long excuses, just miscalculated how long it will take to get here. I always look out to meet young people. And uh, not just because everyone likes to meet their opposite. Like I'm a really old person. In fact, when somebody reads out my life history, I think it's sounding a bit like an obituary now. <laughs> <laughs> but the reason for that is the Commonwealth is really a young people's organization now. And we are a young uh, people's uh, community. In some of the countries I've been, I've asked how many people would here be the ages of 29 or under, and I've been told, after some whispering, close to 70%. It's a mental habit of ours, and we land up in any place. We think we are an adult society. The very few countries in the Commonwealth which are adult societies, in that sense, the young societies, the people like you, are the citizens, by and large. Your numbers are getting larger and larger. The adults are getting less and less and shrinking all the time. So there are lessons in this moving forward. It's just not symbolically. We say the future of this country lies in the hands of young people. It just lies very literally in the hands of young people now because they are the only ones who can move forward into professions and uh, other things. Well, Thank you for telling me that it's an old building we are in, but it's a young college, but at least it's named after somebody you can be proud of for all time as exemplifying what the power of thought can do. You can be anywhere in the world, but the power of thought can be recognized the world over. And as one of the great development economists, roughly of my generation, a little before, uh, Arthur Lewis, the person I've read about and read his works and I know extremely well, and I'm very happy and I'm very proud that I'm in a place associated with him. The Prime Minister spoke this morning at this meeting, and uh, he was good enough to cite me. He said, uh, Secretary General came to see me yesterday, and I said, thank you for coming to St. Lucia. You've come a long way. And he said, well, the SG gave me a very quick reply. And he said, the Commonwealth doesn't have any periphery. Wherever the Commonwealth meets is the center. This is more literally true of the, uh, the Commonwealth as an organization than many others. Because as just now, uh, Principal Dollar gave you the figure about small states. The majority of our country is a small state, so our ethos is very much of serving human communities wherever they are, in whatever number they are, however well or poorly endowed they are. Because we believe that outcomes globally and returns from international uh, uh, meetings uh, should serve everybody equally, which is why we are here. I was trying to think in the car, would there be another organization in the world which would be holding a small states meeting of small states from around the world? It's true, as the principal said, it's probably will qualify not just as a small state, but as a micro state. It's so small. But that makes it even more impressive. And I really don't think there is any other organization in the world which would be doing this. And you should see that room is full of people, the people from World Bank, IMF, the United Nations, everybody is now beginning to understand. A point we've been making for decades, that there cannot be a distinction based on size, economy, as far as human welfare is concerned. The principal said to speak for 15, 20 minutes, so I have to stop very quickly. 
<laughs> but I want to make some, some points, and I'm sure you've got things on your mind you'd like to ask, ask me. Small states have a particular problem. Because of their vulnerability, it is one of the functions of the Commonwealth to get the world to understand it. And I think they're getting it. Which is that small states, particularly small island states possibly, are particularly vulnerable for a variety of reasons. Their remoteness, their size, the fact that they do not have the human resources to create institutions in the way many others can without investing more than becomes paying for you as a society. Transportation costs, fuel costs just to get them here. Anything you make, if you want to send somewhere, how much that is going to cost. Investors coming in and wondering, do I need to invest here? You can think of all of this. On top of that, you get hit by a trough or a storm or a typhoon or a hurricane, typhoon somewhere else. And it's as if you're put back. It's not as if your problems aren't enough already when you're loaded on to other problems as well. So one of the biggest tasks the Commonwealth has given itself is to create support systems for small states, which makes up to the extent possible for all of these vulnerabilities. And right now, the vulnerabilities we are talking about are in finance, debt servicing. Overall, it means solvency. How solvent are you? We are thought leaders in this. There's a highly indebted poor country program that came from us, skills migration programs. St. Lucia has a huge diaspora outside. You know what skills migration means. Some of you might migrate in, in the time to come. How can it serve the receiving country and the sending country? Those systems have been made by us. Trading, how can you get finance, counter insurance, uh, counter guarantees in order to get investment in here and to be able to export? What are the agencies that you can create? We are working on that now. We are working with IMF and the World Bank into creating a system whereby your debt is adjusted automatically if you have what's called an exogenous shock or an external shock. Environment, of course, the frequency with which you have to suffer environmental disasters is well known. We simply have to develop a product, a financial product, that meets these requirements. We are working on that as well. Technical cooperation and capacity building, which is a lack of all small states. In the Commonwealth, we have immense capacities that have come up. When we started in 1952 and the Secretariat in 1965, 20 years before your college, um, it was a north-south organization in terms of capabilities, but no longer. We have many countries with immense capabilities and we're trying to make a user-friendly software so that people like you can sit on the screen and say, if this is what I want to do, this is the kind of training I want. Where can I go? Which of these commonwealth countries will offer me what? And be able to see it very quickly within a matter of minutes. We are working on that as well. So these and many other uh, initiatives are what we are occupying ourselves with so some of the handicaps which come to small states can be, be rectified like this. The other area you'd be interested in knowing you're working in very strongly is actually whatever pertains to young people. I already mentioned the, the growing number of young people, but young people today are not, if you are 18 or 19 years old sitting across me, I'm 100% certain that I wasn't like you when I was 18 or 19 years old. I think you are more like adults than I was, or ever could be, because the information you can download or see on a screen brings the whole world to you. There's nothing that is hidden anymore, which is why you have a revolution in education. You have something called MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. Because of this phenomenon, there's the technology, there are the young minds, they don't want to spend all their times uh, in, in 
in, in, in pursuit of studies. They can study when they want. But this is the world you're in right now. So we have created something called Commonwealth Connects. It's a huge platform. There are 140 what's called communities of practice on it. And they, can, they are connected all over. We are making particular ones, particularly strong ones, in the field of elections, the environment, health, and education. And we are encouraging the young to come up and talk and do things for themselves, not with a patrician or a patronizing attitude towards them. So we now have a youth council created just a few months ago in the last summit, which comes to us and tells us what is it that they would like to see happen. One of the successful things we've done is youth entrepreneurship. We have in Asia a young alliance of, 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 of young entrepreneurs, barely above your age, and I've met them. They're the most dynamic groups you can imagine. So we have enabled them to come together and have the young people of the Asian region be together, solve problems together, address the authority together as to what it is that you want, uh, what it is the, they want from them, create their own policy. It's an enormously successful one. And right now we are engaged in seeing how this can be replicated. How this can be replicated in other parts of the world. Certainly here in the Caribbean uh, would, be, would be a huge chief. The third point, of, point I want to make is education. I am told that boys underachievement is a huge problem in the Caribbean. Now this is very ironic because these are small societies Therefore, the opportunities which small societies have, particularly given the world outside and the way we work, should be growing and not shrinking. But we are working through this education hub in creating those facilities, those, those, cur those curriculums, and that material which will engage your minds. We started with the age group 7 to 14 already on the back of the Commonwealth Games, because we know that the Commonwealth Games is like a flagship of the Commonwealth, and many young people would be interested in watching it. And once they enter it, then this whole world of Commonwealth values comes, comes to their doorstep, as it were. I hope in your, uh, as soon as I stop talking, which won't be long now, you'll give me some of the ideas of what you would like to see in the facilities that we are, we are wanting to create. And I want to say in the end something about values. We like to call ourselves values-based organization because the global wisdom that we bring to the world is that we can be a settled and a comfortable community among ourselves if you all share the basic values of equality, of a democratic culture of respect for individuals, of what we call multiple personalities, rather than the philosophies that want to reduce you and to make you singular personalities as if this part of you is all that matters and nothing else matters. We have, in fact, a lot of Commonwealth wisdom, and I hope you'll be able to read a seminal work, which is Civil Parts to Peace. And it's a very simple idea. Many of the ideas, they are very simple. And one of the ones that's most striking is multiple personalities. I can be very wedded to my faith. I can be a professional. I can be a civil engineer. I can be interested in European enlightenment. The thoughts, I can love Russian novelists. I may be a secret believer in unidentified flying objects. I can follow Arsenal. I can follow the West Indies cricket team. I'm all of that at the same time. And this is the Commonwealth in any event, in its essence. We are, have representatives from the Caribbean, from the Pacific, from Europe, from Africa, from Asia, from the old Commonwealth, from the new and emerging Commonwealth, big countries, small countries, developing, developed, emerging. You name it, we have it. Which is why when we come up with an idea, it is already an idea which is global in its potentiality. 
And this influence which the Commonwealth has had has been enormous. In the Pacific, in Africa, and here in the Caribbean. If you look at the values of the CARICOM as a Caribbean community, you will see that they are really interchangeable with the values of the Commonwealth. And why is that? Because the membership of the CARICOM is almost entirely the membership of the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth gives confidence to all its member states, no matter where they are in the world, that they can all live by these shared values and create an aspiration for themselves as societies which is worthy of, of themselves and which respects each individual citizen. And in the end, if I were to be asked with a gun on my head, as you can go on and on and on about the Commonwealth, what would you think is the primary purpose of your existence? And I would say to serve the dignity and the opportunity to the extent possible for us, for every single citizen of the Commonwealth. This is why we are here, but right now we are concentrating on what is the challenge, the dilemmas, and both the opportunities, as well as the threats before the small states. And how can we show solidarity with countries like that? And how can we, we be a practical partner for countries like that and people like you? We are a visionary organization. We see far, but I like to think we are also very practical a very practical organization with toolkits in our hands. So thank you very much, Principal. I'm sorry uh, it wasn't 15, 20 minutes, but never mind. I didn't see you looking at your watch. No, was that? Thank you. I'm reinforcing myself so it should be true. <laughs> Let's speak a little louder, that's all. Any questions? You mean there are no rehearsed questions? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you tell someone to get up and say something? <laughs> Ask something? Why don't you get up and ask me? <laughs> <laughs> What's on your mind? Yes, yeah. What would you like to know about the Commonwealth? serious about consolidating it. We have an uh, alumni dictionary, a directory. I, it is, I, I've spent some time in the last two years um, through uh, the Prince of Wales and encouraging additional scholarships which can be given to the Commonwealth. And this will be for any Secretary General one of the top priorities because this is the way exchange between students take place. This is where the flavor of the Commonwealth comes up. And it's an interesting thing because the Commonwealth as an idea is so persuasive and is so gripping that once you have enjoyed a Commonwealth scholarship, you feel that you have become the beneficiary of something very special. I won't say it becomes a life's mission, but you do feel that you become exceptional in some way. And I, I, I found so many people who said, well, you know, I feel that as a Commonwealth scholar, I'm something very special. If and I that may, I represent a kind of if universality I may, if I may, of sentiment. If I may, yeah. um, let, me, let me say that. In fact, I, I, I do share the views expressed by the General Secretary, not because somebody told me, but in actual fact, because I do feel special because I am a, a Commonwealth scholar. <laughs> 
I'm glad I have this for this year as well that over the last um, week or so, I have had reason to understand and appreciate the Commonwealth Games as well because I have had, I have been interacting with a number of colleagues of mine who play bridge. And um, they, they, they said that having gone to the Commonwealth Games in 2004 in Manchester, um, they, they went there to play bridge and the, the whole concept and understanding of bridge has actually changed for the better. So again, we at least there are two very practical um, instances that, that I have felt that my life has been improved because of the Commonwealth. Thank you very much for that. Commonwealth is like a bridge. Bridge between the old and the new, young and the old, one part of the world to another. That's a very special feature about it. So thank you for, for corroborating it and thank you for asking that question. Okay, question number two. For Cosmic Scholarships, um, if I may, recently we, we had a lecture for um, celebrating Nobel Laureate Week, and the featured speech, speaker um, advised that one of the things that's going to save our community, the most important, is the human resource development. Yeah. Um, and apart from offering the few scholarships, and as you speak about, I don't know, the, the Commonwealth Connect, does the Commonwealth have a plan to assist small island states in helping develop their human resource? Actually, because we are an <clears throat> organization with a relatively modest budget, we don't go in for heavy investment. Uh, partnership programs like infrastructure development. And we concentrate on the development of skills, know-how, and human resources. Partly because, well, because it fits our budget, but also because that's the best possible investment. You invest in, in a person, you've invested in the lifetime of a person's ability to be able to serve their society. The one way you can do it is through individuals. But the other way you can do it is through regional organizations. Which is why, let's say, with CARICOM, we would seek how is it that we can become a partner in the programs that you yourself are doing. And just yesterday, I was talking to the Honorable Prime Minister here. And he says, look, take one area, discuss one area out of many, and just take legislative drafting. If you were to come to me with a scheme that, look, five or six people can be trained by you in legislative drafting, then I might be ready also to make an investment. Because for me, that human resource creation is so crucial. So the, this is what member states tell us. This is what we want to do in any event. And my feeling is that once this program I mentioned to you is called COM Partner, COM Partnership, where you'll be able to go directly to a Commonwealth member state, see what programs they have, because most of these programs, certainly in the developing world that have capacities like India, Malaysia, Singapore, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Nigeria, South Africa, they really are based on human resource development. That is what they concentrate on. Because having reached a certain stage of development, they know from their own experience that this has been the most precious thing for them. So I think going forward, there's no question in my mind that this is an area which is going to be going always to see expansion. At the back, yes, please. Yeah. Just a little louder. You spoke a lot about youth and youth development, and you also spoke a lot about interaction between member states, the Commonwealth. Do you engage in student exchange programs, or was that ever like an idea put forth? Because if we're speaking about human development and developing people, starting from an early age,
um, they live like the culture, yes, for that aspect of human development? Yes, no, that's the answer to that is yes. It's not a big yes, but it's yes. Um, because the Commonwealth is just not intergovernmental meetings. And the meeting which we're having now is primarily intergovernmental because we want decisions from the government and from the institutions that are represented there. But there are about 90 organizations that carry the name Commonwealth. And this is the civil society. And the beauty of the Commonwealth is that as an idea, as an idea, it exists at all levels among the people at large. So there is a Commonwealth Youth Exchange Program. But the reason I said it's a small yes is that this program is always struggling to be well funded. Because in today's world, if you want money to go into the youth sector, doing youth exchanges is one option you have. But there are other options too. And very often, many governments say, if I do skills development, for instance, if I do uh, uh, something which assists in entrepreneurship or in job creation, then that is something I might prefer to do. So it gets difficult to finance purely youth exchanges. But that still does exist, and I hope that will carry on for the reasons that you mentioned. Yes? I was wondering, on the topic of scholarships, are there any limitations for the kind of scholarship that you could possibly get or apply for? It's um, the, the scholarship program is a collection of various offers from various member states. And each one has their own. You have to, if you go onto the screen, you can see, depending on the state that is offering the scholarship, what subjects they're being offered in, what levels, whether undergraduate, research, postgraduate. Uh, these three sectors, which are the institutions that are covered, and what is the financial and the offer. So it's, it's, it's very varied. It depends on where you want to go and which one of these you want to use. There's, there's nothing in the Commonwealth which says that you ob if you observe this minimum standard, only then can you offer a Commonwealth scholarship. There's really nothing like that. So it's, it's, a, it's a very mixed bag. small island states you know, and how we see our presences in the global market. With reference to um, the problems specific to us in comparison to other organizations, how, how feasible, how applicable are the Commonwealth's ideas in combating the issues that we now have, especially in terms of our dependence on trade, for example, and stuff like that? Uh, just now what we've been looking at, the presentations being made, is something which is called uh, vulnerability resilience profile, VRP for short. And there's a graph. This is vert horizontally, it says resilience, vertically, uh, it says vulnerability. And depending upon an examination of where a country is, they can place a country in the graph that this is where you belong. Mm -hmm. But having understood it, having got the data finally with you, and knowing what you need to do, then you can plot yourself up horizontally in the direction of resilience. For instance, take a very obvious example if you have a monoculture, if it depended upon one or two exports, which was the case earlier in commodities, if earlier enough, once the trade regime changed, and suddenly you found you can't export bananas, you can't export sugar, it takes you years to come out of that situation. But a constant sensitive examination of your index will show that according to the trade regimes coming into play, in 10 years, that is where you're going to be. So this is what your policy should be now in diversifying it. 
seeking investment, whether it is tourism or any other area, or services, it's a similar situation. In other words, you look at those who can be your partner, but you have to develop a national plan for yourself. Some of the features I mentioned are common, or vulnerability, but some features are unique to every country in the, in the sense of both vulnerability as well as opportunity. And so one has to identify what these are and build upon them. I'm glad this idea is now picking up in the United Nations. We can take a significant credit for intellectual property of this, of, of this idea because we've been flogging it for about 10 years. But people are now starting to get it which is in a dynamic world, you need a dynamic formula, not just one which says, are you poor or not, according to per capita income. And you might be in that situation for years and years. But you should not be in free fall. It, the big characterization of the world today is its interdependence. And the small countries are the worst hit because they never cause the problems. If fuel is expensive coming here to St. Lucia, there's nothing St. Lucia did to make the market for fuel more expensive. If your banks are short of money, if the credit is, uh, rate is going up, and all that is happening, the shrinkage of your financial economy, it is because of a financial global mismanagement which started this and it has come and hit St. Lucia here. Similarly, environment certainly don't cause those problems. Trading, remoteness, the regimes tend to be made by bigger players. And so there is, there was this an article which said the world is, at that time when it was written, unfortunately consists of decision makers and decision takers. And what the Commonwealth says is that you cannot have a world divided like this and be at peace. Everyone has to be a decision maker and make their own contribution into the debate as to how their interests are protected. Another one? Um, you mentioned that there isn't really a line between if you're a rich country and if you're a poor country. But, well, I'm not sure how to phrase this, but um, it seems like most organizations that give help to developing countries, it seems like St. Lucia doesn't really fall in that category anymore. Like, its economy is still good enough to maintain like, itself, but not good enough to provide all the infrastructure and the resources to develop people in the island. You know what I mean? Like, it's not needy enough. It's not poor enough to need a lot of outside help, but it's not wealthy enough to maintain itself well. Like, yes, well, the Commonwealth is unique in the sense that the representation it has in numbers and uh, the differences which the members have is quite unique. Um, it's, it is true that there are many other organizations which have this kind of membership. You have the Francophonie, which has this kind of membership. You have the Lusophone. Portuguese have this kind of membership. But the Commonwealth is quite unique in the representativeness which it has. Therefore, the, the way in which it can leverage global attention is unique. Because when we speak, everyone senses that what the Commonwealth says, that this is what they feel, is an idea whose time has come. And the Commonwealth is seen as a different organization in that potentiality than the others. But you're also right in saying that within the organization itself, there may be limited means of assisting countries that need that help. But this is where the second strength of the Commonwealth is. You may be modest in financial terms, but in terms of credibility for the outside world, it's so deep that you can have potential partners who can take you down the road you want to travel. So many of the 
collaborations we do in the field of trade, for instance, we have a program whereby we facilitate trade of small states. You've got two of them here in CARICOM. 80% um, of that partnership is financed by Europe. And so we hope that moving forward, in these hubs that I have mentioned, they will serve small states like St. Lucia. But the financing of the input that goes in and the partners who will be available to you are not going to be financed by me. I'll simply be the person who has managed to introduce them from the, uh, from the Secretariat by creating this service. So there is this unique potentiality which the Commonwealth has of causing things to happen, not necessarily doing those things yourself. <laughs>